Though it may not seem like it, I'm actually a very private person. I never share everything 100% with anyone, and if I think about it, I've always been like that. I definitely have a subconscious guard up, and it's been that way for as long as I can remember. However, I'm aware and working on breaking that guard down, and one way I'm doing that is by sharing today's episode. In this episode, I'm pulling back the curtain that is my life and getting intimate. I'll be sharing stories about my past and how they've shaped me today, so you can get to know me, Rhea, the founder of City Girl Savings, on a much more personal level. I hope you enjoy. Welcome to the City Girl Savings Podcast. I'm Rhea Reeves, founder and finance coach of City Girl Savings. I turned my life around with budgeting many years ago, and now I'm on a mission to help others do the same. I fully believe that you can enjoy your life on a budget. And this weekly show will focus on the intersection of money and the city girl lifestyle. Join me every week, along with some special guests, as I share my experiences, advice, and guidance on navigating life and money as an experience-loving millennial. Before I start diving in, let me just say that I'm very proud of the community I've created. The City Girl Savings community is judgment-free, inspiring, and willing to talk about anything. I'm going to share some stuff with you today that could warrant judgment, but I ask that you keep an open mind and remember that we all have stories. Let's empower and uplift, not judge and break down. So let's kick off with childhood. I was born to an African-American father and German-American mother. So yes, I'm half black and half white. My mom was almost 35 and my dad was almost 27 when they had me. I was the first for both of them. Now, my parents are both from Rochester, New York. And apparently, my mom had never wanted kids before she met my dad. Sadly, she'd lost her mom at age 13 and her dad at 15. So I never met my grandparents on my mom's side, and my dad always wanted kids. And funny story, they met at a club in Rochester, and the rest was history. My dad was in Rochester visiting, but he had lived in Dallas, Texas at the time. And eventually, my mom moved to Texas to be with him. I'm not exactly sure how they made it to Austin, but that's where I was born. And my brother came two and a half years later. So we had a four-person household until I was about nine. There was infidelity, and my mom, brother, and I moved into a bigger house right around the corner. Funny story, the house I grew up in is still in my family. Before my dad died, he had kept everything as it was when we were living there. He was sentimental, and I didn't quite realize it until after he was gone. But getting back on track... I can say this, the infidelity that I was witness to growing up definitely caused me to have trust issues with men later in life. It's weird, though, because I always trusted my dad. I felt secure, safe, and truly unconditional love from him. He was the best dad, but his actions as a husband had a real negative impact on me. I remember I told him that once, and he was genuinely surprised. I wish I could have had more conversations like that with him, just to understand what his thought process was. Now, from when I was a baby until I reached high school, my brother and I would spend our summers in Rochester. So my dad would take us, we'd stay with extended family for a month or two, and then my mom would pick us up. So we were without our parents for nearly two months, the entire summer when we would go to New York. And that's probably why I'm so independent today. And I love those summers. I remember I would plan my outfits in advance and pack weeks early. A true Virgo, right? (laughs) So I should add that both of my parents didn't grow up in the greatest of areas, but I never thought anything of it when we went. Growing up in Austin, actually a a suburb of Austin called Cedar Park, I went to a majority white school 
And so it was a whole different world for me spending time in Rochester. There was definitely a lot more diversity. And by the time I moved to Los Angeles for college, I was definitely craving the diversity. From kindergarten to fourth grade, I went to a private school. And the private school was a Baptist academy with grades kindergarten through 12th grade. So the entire school year system all packed into one building. And because it was a Baptist school, I remember every Wednesday mornings, we would all pile in the auditorium and sing songs and listen to worships and praises. It was definitely an experience. The school also had a daycare, so my brother and I would spend our summers there when we weren't in New York. I remember just being so filled with joy seeing my mom or dad walk in to pick us up to go home. And my dad was a business owner and my mom worked full time in corporate America. So there were times where my brother and I were literally the last kids to be picked up. The daycare closed at 630 and often my dad would stumble in around 645 and finally pick us up. After we left the private school, so I was there until fourth grade, we got to stay home by ourselves during the summers. So we were finally old enough to not have to go to daycare. In fourth and fifth grade, I did karate and I actually met one of my best friends there. She's still a best friend of mine to this day. So my brother had actually started going first. Yes, my younger brother. And I guess I had FOMO or something because I wanted to join too. I remember we would go to tournaments and I would never ever get gold medals, but I got some bronze and silver medals. During that time in my childhood, I feel like I was always into something. And before I got to eighth grade, I collected celebrity autographs in the mail. So I would research addresses for celebrities, send them letters asking for an autograph, include a self-addressed stamped envelope for them to return the autograph, and I would get autographed pictures in the mail. I have probably 100 autographs, and I still have them in my binder today. How funny. Who does that? (laughs) Other things I would do, I would write skits for my friends and I to act out. So whether I was copying a show or just coming up with my own ideas, I would literally write out these scripts and me and my friends would play them out. I also love the holidays and I've always been like this since I was a kid. There was definitely a point in time where I was obsessed with painting Christmas ornament ceramics. (laughs) There was this store here in Austin called Garden Ridge, and they would have little ceramic Christmas designs and little paint pouches. So I would always get them and watch like Hocus Pocus and (laughs) paint the ornaments. And I also love to read. I still love to read to this day. I don't paint ceramics anymore, but I love to read to this day. Now, I got really interested in acting around the fifth grade. I had a tutor who did a play in college and had shared with me that she had an agent. She shared with me her headshot, and it totally opened my mind to this idea of acting. And so I wanted to do the same. So I ended up doing some research and figuring out how I could act around Austin. I got myself an agent and I would audition around town. Total sidebar, but funny story. My dad took me to an audition for a print ad in the newspaper and I didn't get the part, but they saw him and they gave him the part. I was a little too fair skinned for what they were looking for. My dad was darker, and they ended up casting him. So he got the print ad in the newspaper. He felt bad. So the money that he earned, he put in a bank account for me. How funny is that? (laughs) Now, my acting around town eventually landed me a TV movie that was on the PBS channel. I remember we had a premiere for it and everything. I had invited two friends to get dressed up and go with me. And I was in theater throughout middle and high school, and I knew I wanted to pursue acting in L.A. when I graduated. 
If you want to hear that story, you can listen to episode one, where I basically share how I got to LA, fumbled my finances, and ultimately started City Girl Savings. Now, another good childhood memory of mine is going to the Dallas Cowboys games. So I had mentioned that my dad lived in Dallas. He had always been a Cowboys fan, and we have been going to games since 1997. So I was nine years old in 1997. My brother was six and a half. My dad got season tickets starting in 1997. I think we went before then, but I really can't remember. But I do remember since 1997, we've always had season tickets. And when my dad passed away, my brother and I decided to keep that tradition going. So we still get season tickets to the Cowboys games to this day. So now I'm approaching eighth grade era. And at this point, I was focused on other things. I really wanted to be a cheerleader. I made the team because everyone in middle school made the team, and I loved it. I ended up trying out for high school cheerleading, and I made the team my freshman and sophomore years. Unfortunately, I didn't make varsity, and it was devastating. It was also the year I got braces, so I felt like my life was just the worst. If I could go back in time, I'd tell myself to suck it up and get over it because you have no idea what hard times are. But hey, we don't know what we don't know. So like most people, when I got to high school, I started dabbling in adult stuff. There were parties, there were boys driving for the first time. Funny story. (laughs) My birthday's in September and the school years in Texas always start in August. So there was a point in my junior year for about a week and a half where I was 15, getting ready to turn 16, but my dad had a company car that he had decided to gift to me, and I was able to drive it to school as long as I didn't tell my mom. Well, one day, just so happens within that week and a half of me being 15 right before 16, my mom got home early from work one day and she saw the car wasn't in the driveway. And when I got home, boy, did I hear it. (laughs) That was the last time I drove the car to school until I turned 16. When I turned 16, though, I got to have a birthday party. So my dad had just bought a property and the property was empty. And I asked if I could have a party there for my 16th birthday. He said yes, as long as there was no alcohol. And, you know, high school, 16, junior, seniors, like, yeah, there was alcohol. And I remember my dad came to the party at about midnight and everybody started running. They thought it was the cops. It was just my dad. But unfortunately, a lot of people showed up. They didn't trash the place because there was nothing in there, but it definitely wasn't as clean as when we got there. And there was alcohol. So my dad was pissed. A group of girlfriends and I were supposed to stay at the house for a sleepover. He ended up making us all go to his other house where he would be. And we had to have the sleepover there. That was a fun and interesting time, but another lesson learned and another opportunity for me to grow up. Unfortunately, my first car only lasted me about three months. Being stupid and silly, I was speeding with a friend and there were other friends in another car that were speeding and I don't know what we were doing racing, just being so stupid. And I ended up crashing the car and totaling it. The ambulance came. I had a girlfriend in the car. I remember calling my dad and the panic in his voice was something I'd never heard. But once he got to the accident scene and saw that we were okay, His worry turned to anger, and I had never seen him so mad. He was so furious with me. He ended up telling me later that that was probably the worst thing I had ever done as a child. And I thought I was going to get another car quickly. That happened junior year. I didn't get another car until I graduated senior year. So I pretty much spent my high school driving years not driving. 
that was a wake up call. (laughs) I really thought that, hey, I was going to get a car and everything would go back to normal. There would be no consequences. And boy, was I wrong. So high school, I had my first real boyfriend in high school and we dated junior and senior years. He was actually a Mormon and he was the star on the basketball team. And the summer after senior year, he was entertaining a girl who looked like me, but was also a Mormon. And I remember this vividly. We had fights over this, like they met at church. And so they would hang out, even though me and him were in a relationship. And eventually he said that, hey, they were done talking. He wasn't going to talk to her. And so we were at the movies and she texted him. He like pulled his phone out of his pocket and like tried to hurry up and close the phone. But I saw the message and it was, hey, what's up or what's going on? Something that basically implied that they talk regularly. I remember I walked out of the theater and I had a friend come pick me up. And for dramatics, I took the necklace he gave me off my neck and tossed it to the ground. Again, so funny just thinking back at that time, like this was the worst thing that could happen, but little did I know. That's nothing compared to what I've gone through in life. You know, as traumatic as that was and dealing with trust issues, I was ready to break up with him anyways. I was moving to L.A. that September, and I wanted a fresh start. I did not want a boyfriend long distance in L.A. So although the experience didn't help with my trust issues, I got over it quickly. Now, college was a whole new world for me. I was officially out of my suburban bubble and in a big city all by myself. And I did not have a car my first year of college. My dad was like, no, you need to focus on school. You're at the dorms. You don't need to be going anywhere. You don't need to be driving. So didn't have a car my first year, but I had a blast. (laughs) And I was super, super broke my first year of college. I remember I had a girlfriend at the time and there was this Chinese food delivery place close by our campus and we loved their Thai basil. But as the year went on and we like spent any money that came to us, we didn't have any money, but we really wanted this Chinese food. So we literally scrounged our community couches. So she lived in the dorm upstairs. We went through both of our couches and scrounged up enough change to order a Chinese takeout meal to split. And that meal is Thai basil. It was chicken with Thai basil so good. Never had Thai basil that good before, but I will never forget that story. So my second year of college, I did end up getting a car and was able to drive it from Texas to Los Angeles. And I did this trip with my mom. Gosh, as fun as this trip seemed in the beginning, it ended up being a nightmare. So my mom and I stayed in a hotel as we drove this car up And she ended up having to go to the hospital. Like the ambulance and everything came to get her from our hotel room because she couldn't breathe. I remember like being at the hospital in the bathroom, crying on the phone with my dad. And I vividly remember him telling me that, you know, I hadn't lost anyone before. So I don't know what it's going to be like, but, you know, mentally prepare myself. Little did I know he was giving me that advice to handle my first loss, which would eventually be him years later. My mom ended up being okay. We later come to find out that that was when my mom got COPD or that's when her COPD had a flare up. And so now she has COPD. She's on oxygen. So her situation's gotten worse, which is normal with COPD. But that was kind of the start of it all. But anywho, you know, my mom ended up getting better, going back to Texas. I had my car in L.A. for my second year of college, and this was when my spending got bad. I was driving all around everywhere. I had friends. We were going to shopping malls. We were going out to eat a lot, going to NBA games, going to little under 21 clubs, we were always out. And there was a mall, it was Glendale, the Glendale Galleria for (laughs) anyone who's in the LA area. The Glendale Galleria was about 15 minutes from the campus. So little unknown fact, my first two college years 
in LA were at Cal State LA. I ended up graduating from CSUN, but I started my California adventure at Cal State LA. So Cal State LA was close to the Glendale Galleria. I got a job there. There was a store called Art and B. It was like Wet Seal's older sister. And this allowed me to take 50% off of all clothes. So I was in there all the time. So the manager was like, hey, do you want a job? And I was like, sure. 50% off, sign me up. (laughs) I ended up actually working this job all the way through graduation and a little after. And the manager and I became really close. I had to drive my car back to Texas a couple times and she would come with me. Total sidebar. While it was a retail job that was just there to help get me by in college, definitely wasn't making a lot of money and I was spending a lot of the money working there, I did take it serious. One thing that I've realized about myself is when I commit to something, I'm 100% committed. I'm very loyal to whatever, whether it's a person, a job, an activity, I'm very committed. So I would do a good job there. So much so that when I would come home to Austin for like summer and winter breaks, I got to transfer to the Art and B in Austin. So I would work at the one in California when I was in California and then the one in Austin when I was in Austin. Now, as I mentioned, my main goal for going to L.A. was to pursue acting. I didn't have a car my first year, so I couldn't really audition other than doing stuff on campus, which I did get a part in a play and took theater classes. But I really got into acting in L.A. my second year of college. I got a big part in a play. I was really starting to audition. And I remember this. I'll never forget this. This is actually my one major regret in life. So I would send my headshots out to casting directors. That's just what you do as an actress. And I would send it to soap operas. I got a call from the casting director of Days of Our Lives asking if the next day I wanted to go and like have a small part on set. Now, that next day, I had a final exam and I was starting a job, a new job at Express. So I was getting a second retail job and the next day was my first day. So my thought process was, well, I'm turning down two things. So my final exam, skipping my final exam, not going to my first day of work. So basically turning down two things for one, which is Days of Our Lives. I ended up telling the casting director I couldn't make it and to let me know if anything comes up. I remember her voice kind of being in shock, like, oh, you're a stupid girl, but okay. And I do regret that. I wish I would have figured out how to retake the final exam. Forget Express. Like, that job didn't last long anyways. But I wish I would have been able to retake the final exam and see what would have happened. Who knows? Maybe nothing, maybe something. But obviously, it worked out the way it was supposed to. So as I mentioned, my first two years in L.A. were at Cal State L.A., and then I transferred to Cal State Northridge for my final two years. Cal State Northridge was a bigger school, so that meant more parties, bigger games, basketball, just a bigger campus, a lot more people. My grades started slipping, but, you know, I had no choice but to get back on track. I was only in L.A. for myself to act, right? But, you know, according to my parents, I was there for school. So school was supposed to be my top priority. So as my grades started slipping, I got my stuff together. I found out how to kind of manage everything. I started doing more auditions. I got small parts in independent films. I began doing some modeling work. That modeling work ended up turning into more eye candy stuff, which led to a lot more attention from men. I dated a lot. I got invited out to clubs a lot, you know, tables for free bottle service. And this just meant more bad spending patterns. Every time I went out, I wanted a new outfit. So I was going out multiple times a week. That meant buying new dresses multiple times a week. And my final year of college, I turned 21 at the beginning of the school year. 
So now the real fun was beginning. I could go to the real exclusive places because I was 21. So the places I would go to, I mean, there would be athletes, rappers, celebrities, like these were pretty major places. I ended up dating a handful of NBA players. Now, I never took them or their words seriously. My trust issues just totally would not allow that. I knew what these men were capable of, so I never let my feelings get far, just entertained and had a little fun. Like I said, I would get free bottle service, free table service for me and my friends. Someone flew a friend and I out to different state. We would get courtside seats. Literally, what a time. At this point in time, too, I was doing more modeling and acting gigs. I actually got a gig that landed me my sag after status. So sag after is a union. And if you want to be in like major movies or major TV shows, you have to have the sag after status. But it's a catch-22. You can only get the status if you're in a project for SAG or AFTRA, and you can only get a part from, for SAG or AFTRA if you are SAG after status. So it's a catch-22, but occasionally a project can be SAG and they can bring on a non-SAG person and that person just has to become SAG. And so that's what happened to me. And I'm still a member to this day, actually. I just pay my union dues twice a year. And I'm a member. So if I ever get an audition for a movie, I can get in it because I still have SAG status. Now, one thing I remember kind of in my college years was I had a lot of friend drama. Friends would call me selfish. And though I wasn't selfish, I can truly say I'm not a selfish person. I can say that I'm a very one tracked mind person. So At the time, I was just very focused on my goals, very focused on the things I wanted. And because of that, I didn't always take the time to give my friends what they needed. And now flip side, they didn't tell me what they needed. I would just kind of be on the receiving end of their blow ups. So there was definitely room for improvement on both ends. But that happened a handful of times. And I, you know, lost some friends because of that but also ended up gaining friends. Two of my very best friends to this day came from Cal State Northridge, and we're still the best of friends. I love them. Are you tired of wondering which moves to make next with your money? Do you need some guidance on whether to pay off debt, save, or focus on something else? Get my free Money Moves packet today and start making impactful money moves instantly. Go to citygirlsavings.com forward slash moves to download your Money Moves packet now. So I graduated from college in 2010 with my degree in finance. I had a May graduation and my first job out of college started in August for a major bank. (laughs) My first job out of college for this major bank was a part-time home loan debt collector working 3 to 9 p.m. Okay, so I wanted these hours so that I could audition during the day. So I was done with school. I had to have money coming in so I could afford to stay in L.A., but my only purpose for being in L.A. was auditioning. So this gig seemed to work out pretty nicely, but unfortunately, it took one and a half paychecks to cover my monthly rent. So that could only last so long. And again, if you listen to episode one, you'll hear that whole story and how it played out. Eventually, that 3 to 9 p.m. shift transitioned to 12 to 9. So I got hired on full time and started making more, which helped me stay in L.A. longer. I ended up leaving that bank in May of 2021. So I was there almost 11 years, and I love that job. Not so much the work, but I feel like that job just got me through some really important times in my life. It was my first job out of college. When my dad died and I had to move back to Austin, they offered me to work remote if I wanted to stay there, and I did. So, you know, I worked remote for them for, geez, eight years. So they were just so good to me. Like I was with them for a third of my life, you know? And so when I did end up leaving, although I was ready to take City Girl Savings full time, 
I was sad. You know, this was a chapter of my life that was closing. But not only did I gain a lot of experience and knowledge of handling corporate America and, you know, just being in that kind of position, I did a lot of different jobs there. I actually met my now partner there. (laughs) His name is Wesley. I met him in early 2021. Funny story. I would see him around the bank, but we worked like different shifts. So I would just get a quick glance at him. And I thought he was so cute. And I remember telling my friend, my work friend, that I thought he was cute. And, you know, I didn't think anything of it. I wasn't like pursuing him or anything. I didn't want a boyfriend. But she ended up working a Saturday shift and he was there. And she told him (laughs) that I thought he was cute. She actually told him that. And so when he eventually kind of noticed me, he shot me a work email. And I remember he shot me this email. It said, hey, beautiful. And then he walked past my cubicle and like gave me a little smile. And (laughs) the rest was history. I messaged him back and we ended up exchanging phone numbers and talking and we became official boyfriend and girlfriend 4th of July that year. So let me say, I was not looking for a boyfriend. And in the beginning when I was dating him, I made that very clear. I was like, I'm not looking for anything serious. I just want to have fun. I was going out a lot, still like being surrounded by athletes and just that lifestyle. So I really wasn't looking for anything serious. I had just thought he was so cute and wanted to see where it was going, even though, you know, I knew it wasn't going anywhere serious. But we ended up spending so much time together that, you know, we decided to just make it official. And it was more my idea than his. And I guess moral of the story, when you're not looking for something, you just may find it. So be open and be fluid and flexible. So when we became official... Like I said, I was still kind of in this stage where I was going out a lot and I still kept that up. Even though we were in a relationship, (laughs) I was going out like with my friends and he would, you know, stay at my place or like I would end up at his place. And it took a handful of years to get that out of my system. I eventually got there. It led to, you know, a lot of arguments. I wasn't going to stop doing what I was doing. And, you know, my argument was, hey, when you met me, I was doing this. Like, you can't expect me to change who I am. And then, you know, over time, as I got older, you know, I really realized I didn't have any business being out, number one. And number two, it just wasn't as fun as it used to be. But we had some kind of trust issues. So trust issues has kind of been a theme my whole life. And In the beginning of our relationship, you know, I had trust issues with him. And, you know, I think he probably had some with me, but he ended up coming back to Texas with me and meeting my family, including my dad. So he met my dad before my dad passed. And I'm not going to lie. I was hesitant. I was like, I've never brought a guy home before. Do I really want this guy meeting my family and like knowing me on that kind of level? Remember how I said I was guarded? Well, this was a huge deal. He ended up coming with me and, you know, I'm glad he did, like looking back, because we were getting closer. We actually ended up taking our first international trip together, which was a seven-day Mediterranean cruise in 2012. So this was my first time, like, going international anywhere. He's from South Africa, so, you know, it wasn't too new for him, but it was a good time. My first time traveling with a partner. (laughs) But... When we got back, we hit a rough patch. We ended up breaking up that January after a really bad fight. It was a lot of insecurity on my end and for good reason. And, you know, he was not living up to his potential on his end. So it just made for a really rocky and just not a very stable relationship. So we ended up parting ways We broke up. He ended up moving to the New York, New Jersey area to live with his mom. We still communicated, but, you know, I made it clear like, hey, we both need to work on some things. Let's focus on ourselves and then we can revisit this relationship later. 
So that all happened around the January, February ish time frame. So, you know, I was back to LA living by myself and still going out doing stuff. And then June of that year was when my dad actually passed away. And by then, my boyfriend and I were kind of in a better place. We had decided to get back together exclusively. Even though things were still rocky, we we're still working on things. We had decided to just give it another shot. And when my dad passed away, God, I'll never forget that phone call. So my brother was 21 at the time. And I remember he called me and he was like, what's dad's address? Because my dad had a, a new wife and like lived in a, an area kind of close by. And I was like, why are you asking me that? You know dad's address. Like, what are you talking about? And he goes, dad's dead. And oh, God, whew, sorry, just reliving this is hard. But it's just like the first reaction was shock. Like, what? Like, no, like I had just seen him a couple days earlier because I was in town for a friend's graduation. And it just... Gosh, that was the first time I I lost someone so close. And death is so final. Like with death, there's no hope. If you break up with someone or a friendship ends, like you part ways, but that person is still there. There's still an opportunity to see them, to talk to them. With death, it's so final. There's no hope. Like you're not going to see that person again. You're not going to talk to them again. And if you've never experienced that, it's such a a shocking and hard pill to swallow. It's rough. It's very rough. But I remember when I got that call and I ended up calling my boyfriend, he dropped everything and flew out to me the next day. And that meant the world. After a death like that, I realized the little things just don't matter. The stupid stuff, the petty stuff, like it was so irrelevant my boyfriend showing up for me meant everything. Like all that little stuff literally went out the window. Couldn't even think about it. Couldn't even focus on it. And even like friendships that had ended, those people reached out. So I'm emotional. <laughs> it's crazy that it takes something like that to open your eyes, but it does. And it did. So my dad passed away June 6, 2013, and I was back in Austin July 31st. I really didn't plan to go back to Austin ever, but living in LA, acting was moving very slow and I was working so I could afford to stay in LA. And now like I couldn't audition. It just, it was getting to a point where I was kind of debating, is this really what I want anyways? So when he passed away, it just made sense to move to Austin. Now, I never wanted to move back to Austin. Maybe I wasn't going to stay in L.A. forever, but I was never going back to Austin. But God has a way of giving us what we need, even if it's not what we want. And looking back, this was probably the best thing that could have happened to me. It took the worst thing. But when I got to Austin, my finances changed drastically. Because I got to keep my job and now my expenses were significantly less because I moved in with mom, I was able to just turn my financial situation around. If you listen to episode one, I had already started working on that, but I just got to expedite it so much more so when I moved back to Austin. Another thing that I got to experience after moving back was I learned a lot about a business, small business. I spent time cleaning up some loose ends after my dad's small oil company. So he apparently had created this oil company, a very small. He had a main publicly traded oil company and that was handled by like true like executives and employees or whatever. But he had this small oil company and Apparently, I was on all the paperwork as an owner operator of the company. You know, he didn't trust anyone either. So it doesn't surprise me that I was this kind of second in charge. He had to put someone he trusted me. But that allowed me to kind of experience what it was like with a, a small business. I had to learn how is this set up? What's happening with taxes? He was behind on taxes. So I worked with the CPA to bring everything current. And 
it helped me significantly. And it taught me that, hey, if this is how this is set up, I can set up City Girl Savings. Like I was already in this place where my finances were turning around and I wanted to know how can I help other women do the same. And so it just all meshed together so well. One thing that I did after my dad died and I hadn't done before was therapy. Thanks to my job at the major bank, I got free sessions when dealing with something traumatic like death. And, oh, I will forever be a fan and advocate for therapy. Holy cow. I mean, you know, you have so much stuff bottled up, some stuff that you're aware of, some stuff that you're not. And to be able to just talk it out or have someone ask questions to bring that out of you so powerful. So if you're listening and you're debating therapy, please give it a go. It's worth it. My boyfriend, as I mentioned, he was living in New York, New Jersey area at the time my dad died. But, you know, when he was there for me, we really got closer, got more serious. And I was not moving from Texas now. I was with my mom and my brother, like I'm not going anywhere. So he ended up moving to Texas mid to late 2014. I was also very nervous about this, but I went with it, thankfully. We lived with my mom and my brother and then got our own apartment together. We ended up actually having to break that lease. Gosh, dealing with the IRS with my dad's situation was just a nightmare. And it just made financial sense, like being back with my brother until we could figure things out. We, you know, lived in the house that we had moved to when my parents got divorced. And so my mom actually had health issues. I mentioned the start of her COPD. It got worse around this time. And so she moved into the original single story home that my dad had kept after he passed and the one that, you know, I was actually born in. And so my brother, boyfriend and I stayed in the other house. You know, I was working on CGS at this time or City Girl Savings, but it hadn't launched yet. However, January 1st, 2015, City Girl Savings officially launched and I was so excited. I mean, I I love this company. I love the mission. I love what we do. I love the community. And, you know, I had no idea what to expect, but, you know, it was such a good and fun time. And then things in my life got a little bit more stable. Being a Virgo, I'm very structured. I'm very routine. So literally from like 2015 to 2018, it was work. It was growing City Girl savings. It was saving money, being financially responsible, budgeting, taking trips, seeing friends who lived in other areas. I would say in this time frame, I traveled to the Caribbean multiple times. I went to Thailand. I did Turks and Caicos for my 30th birthday. I went back to South Africa to see where my boyfriend grew up. And during this time frame, I still had trust issues. You know, I just, there were things that I hadn't dealt with, like from my childhood and like what had happened there and, you know, some of the issues we had early on. So I was still working through a lot of this. But my boyfriend and I ended up purchasing our first home together around 2018, right after I turned 30. My brother had purchased his home a a month earlier, so we ended up renting out the house we were living in, still rent it out to this day. But as my boyfriend and I made that purchase, I really came to some realizations that, you know, I did therapy after my dad died, but I didn't handle everything. Grief was coming out in different ways, and I was taking it out on the people I loved most. I was, you know, short sometimes. I wasn't as positive all the time. And so I ended up getting back into therapy. And this time I did it with a man. So I'm just naturally more comfortable around women. I don't know what it is. It's just, you know, it's just something with me. I I love being around women. It's we're so uplifting and empowering and supportive. Even though I've been through issues with girls, it's I still like just I'm drawn to women. But I ended up doing therapy with a male grief counselor. And it's crazy because I got exactly what I needed. So growing up, my dad was very much, he instilled in my brother and I, 
don't show emotion. Like control your emotions, keep your cool, be logical. And while I'm not sure he meant for it to play out this way, that's what I did. I controlled my emotions. I didn't speak about my emotions. I kept it cool. That's why people would say that, hey, I don't care. I did care. Of course I care. I just am not showing you I care because that's, you know, what I was raised to do. And so when I started working with this male therapist, he gave me permission to be emotional. He told me it's okay to be sad. It's okay to have sad days. It's okay to sit in the sadness. You don't have to be positive all the time. Like he gave me that approval I needed to be emotional. And it totally, I'm getting emotional because it totally changed the game for me. It allowed me to sit in my sad feelings. And when I was able to do that, I started getting control of them. It's almost like I'd never controlled my emotions. I just suppressed them. But the minute I started actually feeling my emotions, I could actually control them or I can control the thoughts that create them or I can turn those sad emotions around my dad or anything else and flip it and see the good, see the time I did get to spend with him. So it was game changing. So I know I said it before, but I will always be an advocate for therapy. Definitely, definitely recommend it. So when I did that round of therapy, it helped me work through those trust issues as well. It's really crazy. Everything ties together, even though we don't know it, (laughs) with our emotions and our thoughts and our experiences. And it got me to a place where I had decided that Although I'm scared of being cheated on or someone not being loyal to me, I can't control that. I can only control myself and what I do. And I made the decision that if that happens, if my boyfriend cheats on me or if someone is disloyal to me, I will remove myself from the situation no matter the cost. And maybe you don't agree with that. Maybe someone doesn't agree with that. But that's what I need to move past it to just learn to trust, knowing that I can't control someone else, but I can take care and handle a situation the way I need to if it happens has allowed me to not worry about it happening because I know if it does happen, I'll handle it. But I'm not going to live in this scenario creating something that hasn't happened. So I was able to like let that go. And it's really made such an impact on our relationship, my relationship with my boyfriend. You know, there's a lot more trust. There's better communication. We're genuinely happy. So it took a long time to get here. We've been together 11 years. So (laughs) it took a long, long time to get to this place. But I'm proud to say that we're here. So 2019 to now was really filled with similar things, work, travel. I took City Girl Savings full time. I started prioritizing my health. So I work out Monday through Friday, still like getting the diet in order. I spend time with the people that matter most. More travel, went to Alaska, Antigua, Hawaii, Orlando, Italy. I lived through a pandemic. I mean, I was already a homebody. I was already working from home. So lockdown wasn't too much for me. But, you know, I know a lot of people struggled with it. And here I am to this day, you know, running City Girl Savings full time, still traveling, still taking trips, still with my boyfriend, you know, still budgeting and being an advocate for that. And I'm just so happy. What's next for me? Well, getting through 2022, moving into 2023, just continuing the goal of City Girl Savings, which is to help as many women as possible reach financial success. Some of my current goals, you know, I want to get a second home in Palm Springs. So I'm proactively saving for that. Hopefully I can reach that goal in the next year. And that's it. Travel more, spend good time with friends, make this business everything I want it to be, live a life I love, that's kind of where I'm at and what I'm focused on. 
So I hope that you enjoyed all the stories I shared. (laughs) I know I got a little emotional there, so I appreciate you powering through with me. I think this was such a a good thing for me to break that guard down that I told you about in the beginning. So thank you for listening. Before I wrap, though, I want to share a few rapid fire of some of my favorite things. So you heard a lot of stories, like memories, things like that, some of the stuff I'm working on. But I want to leave you with some things that maybe you didn't know about me. So I'm going to share a few of my favorites. So my favorite color is purple, and I also associate purple with abundance. (laughs) My favorite number is nine. My favorite food is Italian. My favorite guilty pleasure is iced coffees and massages. My favorite TV show, this is a hard one, but I love Charmed, like the original Charmed and Sex in the City. Those are the two shows that I could rewatch over and over and over and never get bored of. My favorite activity is reading and going to the movies. I love the movies. I love going to the movies. My favorite game as a kid was Spyro the Dragon. My favorite holiday is Christmas, but Halloween is a close second. My favorite season is fall. And my favorite travel destination so far is Turks and Caicos. Thank you so much for tuning into City Girl Savings today. I hope you feel empowered and inspired to master your money as you make your way to your dream life. Make sure you subscribe so you're the first to know when a new episode comes out. I truly value your thoughts and feedback, so please leave a review and let me know how this podcast has impacted you. Can't wait to chat soon and make it a great day.